Welcome, everybody. I'm Selena Resvani, and you are joining Women and Work Culture Season 3. You know, this is a live stream all about helping women rise at work. And today, we are talking about a subject that most of us like to avoid, and that's rejection. Um, and my friend and a, a wonderful expert is with us here today. Jessica Bacall is going to be bringing this topic to life. Welcome, Jess. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. So glad to have you and a really big welcome to our community. We are always so happy to learn right alongside you from experts just like Jess. So drop us a note. Let us know where you're joining from. We love uh, shouting you out and engaging with you. Let me give you a little inside scoop on Jess before we dive into some questions. She is the director of reflective and integrative practices and the director of the Narratives Project at Smith College. She leads programs that help students explore identity, uh, to find resilience in community, which is so exciting. And she even teaches a course called Designing Your Path. Don't you wish you had that when you were in college? <laughs> She's the author of two super insightful books. I was really honored to get to be in her first book called Mistakes I Made at Work. She has a brand new book out, which I absolutely love. And uh, this one is called The Rejection That Changed My Life. 25 plus powerful women on being let down, turning it around and burning it up at work. Fierce, so fierce. We can't wait to dig in today. Her HQ, by the way, is in Northampton, Massachusetts, where she lives with her husband, her two kids, and her two doggos also. Um, <laughs> hey, if you have questions for Jess, uh, please ask those, drop those in the comments. Uh, you know, maybe it has to do with mistake making. Maybe it has to do with rejection and how to come back from it let us know and drop us your question. Um, but Je Jess, I wanna ask the first one, which is just why this book? Why this subject of rejection? What made you feel like this I have to write? Yeah, well, I a few years ago, um, so I've been at Smith College for about 15 years and I was leading some you know, popular programs, but there was a big reorg and basically, I decided I wanted to apply for a bigger job. And the process of that was really intense. I had to, you know, plan a big public talk. I had to put forth a mission for a new center. Um, and I was so anxious. I'll just tell you a little story to you can see what a wreck I was. I hired this coach to help me with my public speaking for my public talk. And so I had, um, I had a day where I met with her and then I, drove from her to campus, parked, met with some other uh, friends at work who I was practicing my talk with. And when I went back to my car at the end of the day, I um, saw that I'd left my motor running all day, my car motor. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> I was really like, um, so anyway, I really was kind of a wreck about when I was applying for this job. And then um, it turned out someone else got the job. And when that happened, I felt you know, disappointed. I felt a little humiliated since all these colleagues at work had interviewed me, all these people had supported me and knew I'd applied for this job. But a small part of me also felt relieved. And I thought, you know, this is kind of an important thing to notice. And it made me think maybe reflection, um, maybe rejection is, <laughs> is something to reflect on. Maybe rejection is more complex of an experience than we, than we think of it as. And it could be something you know, interesting to talk to other women about. I had done this previous book on mistakes and I thought, you know, this could be fun to ask people about. Right, I love that. And the stopping and questioning, is it really this all bad one note experience mm -hmm. that a lot of us, you know, have that idea in our head. Right. Um, 
And thank you for sharing your personal experience. That really comes through in the book and, and I appreciate it. I, I love thinking sometimes about uh, rejection as kind of redirection. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I know there are sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it just stings and it just stinks. You know, yeah. it, it feels bad. It feels to you like the wrong decision. But there are times that probably everyone can look back and say, you know what, that was good redirection. You yeah. know, it, yeah. it wasn't so bad after all, like your sense of relief. Um, a great question from Anissa. Welcome from Tampa Bay and welcome Fiorenza from London. We're happy to have you too. What surprised you, Jess, about your interviews? Maybe something that threw you or yeah. you didn't I mean, to see? A couple of things. I mean, one thing that, that surprised me was, um, I talked to Angela Duckworth, who your listeners may know, she's, you know, the foremost um, researcher on grit, she developed the theory of grit, which is this, you know, um, kind of paradigm for how people persevere through difficulty. And she's a psychologist at Penn. She um, said that more tears have gone into her husband's shirt collar than I could imagine, that she cries when she gets rejected. And just thinking about this researcher um, who studies grit crying um, after a rejection made me feel like, okay, this is, it's normal. It's normal to feel really bad. Um, but then, you know, she moves past it. Um, she has different ways of, of, you know, and part of it is that comfort seeking. So that was one surprise. I think another um, is that, you know, for some people, really successful people, they dealt with rejection so often that there wasn't even anything that stood out. Like they couldn't even identify a story. They're, oh, well, you know, this happens all the time. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Hmm. Right. You kind of think of like a freelance journalist or someone who's pitching, you know, constantly, mm -hmm. right? Where it's part right. of exactly. their weekly or daily life. Yeah. Um, what were those people like? Did they have a thicker skin then, or did what did you notice in those? I those, think those people. Yeah, I think these are people who developed um, kind of muscles. Their muscles for dealing with rejection were stronger, where they had been strengthened after years of managing and dealing with rejections. Um, so, like one of the people was an actress, Alicia Reiner, who I spoke with. And she just, it was almost hard for her to identify, you know, a specific story because it happens. So, I mean, if you're an actress, you're, you're rejected all the time. Um, but this, this idea of strengthening your muscles for um, rejection tolerance, I really came through, you know, there were people, there was a comedian who made a project of getting a hundred rejections, seeking out a hundred rejections. Um, in order to get more comfortable with rejection and in order to like put herself out there more. Um, there was a doctoral student who came to her dissertation defense wearing a skirt made of rejection letters. She had, <laughs> she wanted to demonstrate to her peers, like, look, this is what it takes to get a doctorate. I've, I've gotten, you know, papers rejected. I've had fellowship applications rejected, you know, and, and she was wearing them almost as a badge of pride. I love that. And people loving this idea of reframing rejection, mm -hmm. you know, really reframing how you think about it. And yeah. it almost seems like there's a continuum, right? All the way from seeking it out, mm -hmm. you know, like some of your examples. And I love the the skirt, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the outfit made out of rejection. Talk about armor, right? Yeah. And um, kind of strengthening yourself, but to like tolerating it, right? Yeah um you know surviving through it and lots lots of room in between yeah i want to ask you about a term i heard you uh bring up which is post-traumatic growth mm -hmm. this is not a term most people have heard or know um tell us a little bit about that that term yeah i mean this is a term that's been around for a while it's from the field of psychology and it's the idea that after a trauma um, we can experience growth and it can be used um, to talk about like whole societies, you know, the, the growth that's hopefully going to happen, you know, after this pandemic, for example, but also, you know, personally that um, after 
a really hard time, whether it's a personally hard time or um, a, a hard time in your career, um, when you've moved past that, it can also often um, catalyze a period of, of growth in a useful yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, I like that. And is there anything you've learned or might recommend, um, you know, when you've just had that ouch rejection mm -hmm. moment, almost like from a self-care mm -hmm. perspective, um, you know, that you might recommend is, is a good yeah. go-to? Yeah, I mean, I um, there's a few things and there's a workbook in the back of my book that includes exercises um, that speak to this. But, you know, one it is um, resonant with that story I told about Angela Duckworth crying uh, into her husband's shirt collar, which is just feeling your feelings, you know, letting yourself feel badly. Um, and um, I, your listeners may be... Um, uh, familiar with the idea of self-compassion, which comes from a psychologist, uh, UT Austin, named Kristen Neff. But that ability to just let yourself have your feelings is part of self-compassion. Um, the next piece is talking to yourself like you'd talk to a good friend. So instead of saying to yourself, oh, you know, of course, you're, you were rejected, you know, you're, you're never going to get a job, you know, it's saying to yourself, like, okay, this is part of the process. You know, you did the best you could, you know, what the, the, the way you would speak to a good friend. And the third piece of self-compassion is this um, ability to trying to universalize. So, and, and think of your experience as connecting your, you to other people rather than um, letting it isolate you. So it's it's very easy when you've had a rejection to feel shame and think, oh, nothing like this has ever happened to anyone else. Um, but it's not the case. I mean, everyone gets rejected. And so thinking about your experience as something that connects you to other people rather than letting yourself feel isolated, um, I think are all useful strategies. Those are great because um... I think it's sometimes easy to do none of those things and either yeah. kind of freeze, mm -hmm. you know, or, or lower yourself into a, a dark place. Cause you know, you're maybe saying this reject rejection confirmed some things about me, mm -hmm. which is often not true. So right. I love, I love your ideas. And, and also the idea of kind of, telling other people about mm -hmm. your projections, which you did really well in this book, mm -hmm. but, but sharing it with other people, right. And normalizing it for yeah. them, yeah. making it, you know, kind of controlling, um, maybe controlling is a strong word for it, but owning your own narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's really powerful for, for peers in your field or for younger people to hear about your rejections. There's, I learned in, in developing the book about this term um, pluralistic ignorance, which is mm. this idea that, you know, that it hasn't happened to a plurality of people, that, that what you're experiencing, you know, that what you're experiencing has only happened to you. Um, and it's just, it's, it's usually not the case. Mm. Yeah. That's so true. And the unfortunate thing is if you keep to yourself, you know, you can kind of confirm that idea mm -hmm. that this has only happened to me. You know, yeah. I think it's sometimes in those brave moments of sharing it that you realize somebody will say, oh, yeah, it's totally normal to get a mm -hmm. no to that at right. this organization or at this college. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, that's happened to me five times, you know, in the last few years. Right. But uh, hard to get that validation and affirmation if you're not, you know, sharing and willing, mm -hmm. willing to talk about it. So I really believe that's so, so important. Um, I have a question, you know, around appealing rejections, you know, mm -hmm. do you mm -hmm. always have to accept it that, you know, here's the lot you've been given or here's yeah. the hand, hand you've been dealt? I mean, that's such a good question. I, I would love to hear what you think about it. But, um, you know, I think it depends on context. You know, there's one of the stories in the book um, comes from Ali Einbinder, who is a bassist in a punk band in L.A. And she told a story about um, their management dropping them. This is right after they've been named right around the time they were named best punk band in L.A. Uh, by one of the big newspapers out there. Um, 
So they were dropped by their management. They were trying to finish an album. They needed to be in this specific studio with this equipment, with this particular producer to finish because you can't just, you know, every studio and producer has their own sound. Um, anyway, they went back to the management and they said, you know, we really need to finish this album. Can you can you let us do it? And they, they did. They got a week. They had to do it really quickly. They got a week to finish it. Um, and so... I'd like to say it never hurts to ask, but I don't think that that's true for women. <laughs> I don't think, you know, I, I think that it, it depends on context and it depends on how you ask. And so I'd, I'd be curious what you think, Selena, what, what is your experience? Yeah, I, you know, I think I ask about that because it's something I try to promote and teach that sometimes a no isn't final, yeah. you know, or a you're not right for this you know, isn't the final word and it's not always this damning conclusion, end of story. You know, sometimes it leads to something 40% different that like yeah. a, a tweak, you know, maybe that role wasn't right for you, but this one that's slightly different is better. Yeah. Or um, in my own life, uh, I remember getting a financial aid package that was much smaller, mm -hmm. um, you know, in college in my second year which almost made it impossible for me to go back. Um, and appealing that out of a sense of desperation, not yeah. skill or even chutzpah, but just desperation. Yeah. Um, you know, they did, they were able to help and meet me at a higher level of aid dollars, which made a difference. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's kind of holding it lightly, taking a no with like a teaspoon of uh, sugar and, a, mm -hmm. you know, a shake of salt that, yeah. you know, it may not be written in, you know, permanent marker forever. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the stories in my book, I'll just, or did I talk about this in the book? I don't know if I did, but I, I think I, I, anyway, I was rejected from the University of Pennsylvania for graduate school. And this was recent. Um, mm -hmm. I was returning for a doctorate. And I did go back and reapply, you know, and I got in. Oh, wow. um, so, and I went, but, you know, I, I might not have done it. You know, I think in a certain way, my first instinct was to think, like, come up with all the reasons that, like, I didn't want that anyway. Oh, it's too far. I don't want to leave my family one weekend a month. And, um, but then, you know, a friend encouraged me to reapply. And I, you know, I realized, like, in the end, there's no shame in trying again. So, you know, I, and I think, um, so I think I agree with you to like have that attitude overall. It, I think that's a good attitude. I love that you did that. I think that it's, we're all so inspired by you for going back because that story could have ended in a very different way. Right. Which is yeah. okay. They made their choice. Right. This right. is done. Yeah. You know, and, and you chose to see it a different way. So that is really inspiring. I love this question, which comes from um, Shahista. Welcome from Uzbekistan. Oh. So exciting. How can we help our friends, peers, or kids who have experienced rejection? What a great question. Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, Sometimes re it, rejection can be a great um, opportunity to help, you know, these people close to you to reflect on what was the important thing that they were trying, what was most important in the thing they were trying to get. Because sometimes um, the thing, the job or the school or the whatever it is, um, there's something within that that is what matters, but it's not the thing itself. So for example, I'll just talk about my own, you know, when I was applying for this big job at Smith, I think what I really wanted was, you know, recognition and to do work with students that felt meaningful, you know, and, and I, so I think having those conversations about, well, you know, what is it that you, why did you want this? What, what really matters and mm -hmm. how can, how can I support you in, in pivoting so that we can find maybe another way to get that thing. That's awesome. A much more empowering way, right? Than looking um, really narrowly that, you know, there was just this one opportunity, but right. what's beneath it? Yeah. What's driving me and motivating me to want this? Yeah. Because chances are there's more of that, right? There's yeah. more of that thing. Yeah. I love your question, Shahista. Thank you for asking it. And for uh, others of you joining us, if you have a question for Jess about handling rejection, reframing it, 
coming back from it, please ask your question. I would love to hear what some of those are. Um, you talked about this idea of distanced self-talk. Yeah. Which I, I really like that concept. Um, could you kind of give us an example maybe of how mm -hmm. that might work? Let's say we get rejected for, mm -hmm. for a new job we've applied yeah. to that we were excited about. Yeah. Um, I mean, distance self-talk comes from a psychologist named Ethan Cross at the University of Michigan. And he has a new book called Chatter, um, which I'm listening to right now on, on uh, Audible. And I, I really like it. He reads it. Um, anyway, he, uh, but I also got to interview him for my book and, um, it really is about talking to yourself or about yourself or writing, um, in order to get a kind of distance. So, um, you might, for example, you know, if you don't, for me, I might say, you know, Jessica, you didn't get that job at Smith, but it's going to be okay. You know, um, or, or I might sit down and write about myself in the third person in part to kind of do that that meaning making and thinking about what matters, but in part to kind of um, to provide a little bit of distance. So it's that talking to yourself or about yourself, you can actually use your own name um, and not necessarily aloud, but in, in your head or on paper. And it's kind of amazing. They're finding in his lab that this can really help people cope. Um, it kind of, um, it like tricks us into getting a certain kind of distance from our, our problems that helps us to cope. I love that. And yeah. I know I, for me personally, you know, being hard on myself has been uh, always been a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. When something happens or didn't go the way you hoped, you know, some of the, what I call trash, you know, self trash mm -hmm. talk mm -hmm. can be an easy default setting to go to. So yeah. I love your idea to use your own name Mm -hmm. Talk yourself through it. Um, one of the things I've actually done is even use like a nickname, yeah. like a, a little bit, you know, like a, a good friend might say to you, um, yeah. Sleens, it's yeah. okay, <laughs> yeah. you know, in my case. But seriously, just that tone change even makes it feel less grave Yeah, uh, in, in my case. And I think there's, you know, there's a, um, a misunderstanding. Some of us think we need that mean voice in order to motivate ourselves. But th there's, you know, back to the, um, the self-compassion research, Kristen Neff has found that it actually gets in our way. Those mean voices um, don't help us achieve or, you know, get things done. So, yeah. I love that. I love that. So somebody has a tough rejection or face plant. Is there a tip we haven't talked about that you, mm -hmm. you know, you would say this is something you should think about or mm -hmm. act on? What's your advice to somebody I do think that I, I really liked um, another piece that came out of these interviews was using rejection as data. Mm -hmm. So, and this is another way, I guess, and it, that helps us to kind of get some distance. But I, I think there's different ways to do that. So one is using your emotions as data. You know, um, how upset are you and what's the, the piece that you're upset about? Or, you know, I really hated getting rejected. Uh, uh, there's someone named Laura Wang who's at Harvard Business School. She talks yeah. about this a lot. She has a book called Edge. And she told me this story about um, when she was first a faculty member um, being told to network and ask people out uh, on lunch dates. And she asked this dean to go to lunch. But when she sat down with him, he kind of assumed she had an agenda. And hers it was really a networking get to know you mm. lunch in her mind. To him, he was like, okay, if you've asked me to lunch, it must be because you have an agenda because I'm really busy. And the whole thing just made her feel uncomfortable and, um, and rejected. And she realized after that, that, um, you know, the data was maybe that's not the way she was going to get to know people at the, co at, you know, mm -hmm. as a faculty member, maybe a way for her that would feel more comfortable, comfortable would be joining committees, you know, or, um, going to gatherings where she didn't have to sit one-on-one -on -one, um, in these kinds of uncomfortable situations where she wasn't sure if the person wanted to be there. Um, another way of using rejection as data, you know, um, I'll just say for, for my book, you know, there were people who wanted to be in the book and there were people who said no. And I, by noticing patterns um, and who said yes and who said no, 
and what kind of people they often, you know, a lot of the people who said yes were people who already had an interest in mentoring women or had spoken about rejection before. Um, and that was helpful for me in terms of kind of zeroing in on who would be interested in being interviewed. So I think there's different ways we can um, try to use, gather data in our own rejections. I love that. I, yeah. It's much more empowering. And um, I'm right there with you with interviewing women for my own books. It was data to see. Sometimes if people ask me 42 questions about the book, they didn't end up coming on board. But yeah. the people who it immediately grabbed, yeah. you know, did. Uh, and so that was interesting data. And, mm -hmm. and I love your point. Um, I want to ask uh, one more question from a, an audience member, Shahista. She works in career development. And when she prepares students for interviews, she tries to encourage them, tell them to focus on successes. But does she need to mention the possibility of being rejected? Is that a demotivator? Or can they still be confident knowing, uh, you know, they may be told no? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, we, um, I think that using the idea of practice and that, you know, all of these, everyone goes on interviews and it um, gets rejected, but these interviews are practice. You're probably going to do interviews your whole life because usually people don't stay with the same job, you know, their, their whole lives these days. Um, and I think that, um, you know, you could talk about the idea that you might be rejected, but I think more important is the idea that um, even if you get rejected, you've had this practice, which is really useful. Yes, I love that. And uh, Fiorenza encouraging also, maybe a reframe is a good idea, um, Shahista, kind of reframing what the rejection and what some of those no's mean. Um, yeah. I want to ask you one final question. We have a tradition of asking our guests for a parting truth bomb, something you really want to stick in our minds when it comes to this topic. Um, what do you want us to remember when it comes to rejection? I think I'd like people to remember that they're not alone, that, you know, this happens to everyone, that, you know, um, you know, if you read the book, you'll you'll read about people getting booed off stage about, you know, a comedian who gets booed off stage, um, a woman who is pushed out of the company. She started a wow. doctor who was rejected 17 times for medical school. Um, but I think these are, you know, more um, the norm than we realize. And I, I think, you know, the idea that we all get rejected and that maybe um, it's important to share these stories. I love it. That's exactly what you did. I want to thank you for your incredibly inspirational message and advice for all of us. I can't encourage thank people you. enough to go and get this book. One of my favorite parts about it isn't just the stories, but the workbook that's in the back with tons of exercises, experiential things you can do to help yourselves through these moments. Um, so please do check it out. You're gonna see in the show notes, uh, links to grab Jess's book to see what she's up to through her website. And I totally encourage you to follow her here on LinkedIn. I hope you'll stay in touch with me too. Follow me if you aren't already here on LinkedIn. Uh, and I hope you'll check out my newsletter that is 18,000 people strong on LinkedIn, all about building confidence building confidence. Thank you, Jess. Thank you to Thanks, our Selena. Oh, yeah. Anytime. I love having you. And thank you to this community for your wonderful questions, uh, putting yourselves out there. Remember, rejection doesn't have to define you, right? Sometimes it's like one little paragraph in your whole story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? I love so that. Remember that. Uh, stay well, everybody, and lead on. Thank you.